Christian Fellowship. We're streaming live. And uh, we're here in Fruitland, New Mexico. I'm Chuck Reese, one of the pastors here. Jared and some other faithful ministers. We're a small church doing great things. Today's message, a house divided cannot stand. Here in Fruitland, New Mexico, uh, our key verse is John 15, 5. He who abides in me, I abide in him, bears much fruit. That's the bottom line. Getting plugged into church is hanging out with Christians who are, Jesus is in them, but we believe you've got to get straight plugged into the source. Jesus, who died, who rose again, is the source. If you're not plugged into him, you can still go to churches, you can go anywhere on the planet, but you're disconnected. Our admonishment and encourage to everybody is to get plugged into Jesus, the Messiah himself. He gives the Holy Spirit. He's one with the Father. It's not about religion. It's about relationship. We just talked about our announcements, uh, tithes and offerings. If anyone ever wants to give to us, they can text GIVE to 877-557-7717 or go to pushpay.com forward slash G forward slash Fruitland Christian, and that'll bring you there as well. We're doing Financial Peace University starting again Wednesday night, starting the whole nine classes over. If you want to hear a good teaching about stewardship and everything from insurance, buying and selling a house, saving, giving, paying off debt, all that, he's a great financial coach, and his team is amazing, so we're doing that again Wednesday. So that leads us to our message today, A House Divided Cannot Stand. It's sections 109 in the Life of the Messiah, Harmony of the Gospels. And basically it's a chronological look through the life of the Messiah based on the book of Luke, because Luke is the only gospel writer who says that he puts it in a chronological order. So if you read Matthew right after the baptism, uh, 40 days where Jesus was in the wilderness to be tempted, right after he got baptized from Jesus, that's John chapter 4, Next thing you know, John chapter 5, you see the Sermon on the Mount. And for 20 years, I thought the Sermon on the Mount was right after the baptism, and that was Jesus' opening speech before he started his three-year ministry. No, the Sermon on the Mount doesn't start till almost two years into Jesus' ministry. And that's, you can see that because it's based on the book of Luke. We finished chapter 10. We're now in chapter 11. Chapter 10 is where he sends out the 70. They come back. They had authority over demons to cast them out. They don't bind them, can't bind them. We're going to look at that in the text. We believe what the Bible says. And again, a part of my teaching is always to point out some of the extra additional fluff that people add because it sounds good, and we want the authority to bind up demons. Nowhere in Scripture do you have that authority but you can cast them out, and they're free to roam. You can, and we're going to look at the scriptures. So anyway, this is where it's a conflict over the healing of a dumb, dumb mute man. And the reason why the Pharisees and Jewish people were able to cast out demons in the name of God, not in the name of Jesus. They didn't believe Jesus was a Messiah. Here, two years in, they've already publicly declared you're not the Messiah. You're doing your miracles by the power of Beelzebub, which is the devil. So this is the section we're looking at. And before we get into it, let's pray and ask God to bless the reading of his word. What it says, nothing more, nothing less. Even though I'm up here elaborating on it, I want you guys to look at the text and see what the text says. Jesus, we thank you, Lord, that you died and rose again. We thank you for ascending to the Father, sending the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth, Spirit of wisdom, comforter, counselor, we invite you to lead, guide, and direct the study, as well as us personally. Show us what we need to see, what we need to change, and so we can ultimately be more like you. I pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. So we're going to be in Luke chapter 11, verses 14 to 36. I threw in James 4, 7 through 8. Ephesians 6, 12 is where we talk about the full armor of God. And then for extra credit, we're going to end it with Revelations chapter 20, the first 12 verses. And that's where you'll see Satan bound for a thousand years. It's the only time in scripture he's bound for any length of time. And it says it twice, a thousand years. And when the Bible says a thousand years, it means a thousand years. When it says Jesus was in a desert for 40 days, he was in a desert for 40 days. Moses was up on a mountain for 40 days, he was in a mountain for 40 days. When they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. It was 430 years before Moses showed up to let my people go. It was 430 years. In Genesis chapter 1 and 2, when God says six days he made all the earth, seven days he met it, it was six days and seven days he rested. When he talk, God's not confused what a day is, what a week is, what a month is, what a year is. He's not confused. So it says what it says, it means what it means. Amen? All right. 
Harmony of the Gospels. This is the book if you want to look it up. I also have it on a PDF. It just has all the scriptures in a chronological order. This is the section that we're in, 99 through 112. And the section is there's a division over whether he's the Messiah or not. Again, Pharisees have already declared publicly he's not it, and he's doing it by the power of Beelzebub, and that's what we're looking at today. It's the conflict over the healing of a dumb man. So up until this point, you can cast out demons, but if a man was mute and dumb, they weren't able to talk to a demon. A Jewish rabbi would talk to the demon, get his name, tell him to get out, and that's what would happen. So in this case, you got a deaf, dumb, mute demon, and nobody can deal with it. So Jesus does it, and now they've got to come up with a reason why, if you're not the Messiah, how are you doing this stuff? Because they're going on record saying you're not the Messiah. Phariseeism is a religion built on top of Mosaic law. They added a bunch of Mishnaic laws, rules and regulations of what you can't do, which was the size of the Encyclopedia Britannica. That's in addition to the 613 laws that Moses wrote. We call that Mosaic law. That's what Yeshua kept when God told Moses what to write. That was authenticated by the, <laughs> the Lord. Now, all this stuff since Malachi and Matthew, the last 400 years, the Pharisees went crazy train with rules and regulations to keep you from breaking the 613 laws. I always like to say you had a good intention, but they had 1,500 rules on what you can't do on your day off. Does that sound like something you want to sign up for? You want to go through the 1,500 rules on what you can't do on your day off? Either does God. That's why you see Jesus doing a lot of healings on the Sabbath. One, because he's Lord. Two, because it pointed to the Pharisees. You got some rules on your book that I didn't write, and you're bearing, you're bearing burdens on people that have nothing to do with God. It's religion-based. So in Luke 11, 14 to 16, you'll see the charge. You'll see his defense in Luke 11, 17 to 23. You'll see the condition of the nation of Israel, uh, of the Jewish people in Luke 11 through 24 to 28. He also covers it back in section 63. We covered that about a month ago, two months ago. A sign to that generation, we'll talk about the sign of Jonah in 11, 29 to 32, and then a call to the nation to be salt and light, Luke 11, 33 to 36. So that's where we're gonna go, and here we are. Luke 11, verses 14, verse 36. A house divided cannot stand. Before I read, I want to just mention this one thing. Anybody seen anybody who get a divorce? Doesn't happen anymore, does it? In and out of the church, 51%. Christian families, non-Christian families are getting divorced. Second marriages, 80%. Third marriages, higher than that. Why? Because a house divided cannot stand. Church splits. Has this church since 1950-something split up a couple times? Over the carpet, I believe, once. Somebody changed locks on the door once over a disagreement. Every church I know has had a church split. The pastor falls, he goes and starts another church, and half the people who love him follow him. The other people who thought, yeah, he's in sin, shouldn't be a pastor, they stay. The Bible says, he who commits adultery lacks understanding. Any pastor who commits adultery should not be up here because he lacks understanding. He needs to sit down for a few years and be restored back to ministry. Can a fireman put out a fire after he gets burned in one of the burning buildings? Yeah, he has to heal up a little bit, but he's still a good fireman. I believe in total restoration for people in ministry who fall, but they need to sit down. They don't get kicked out of the church. They just get to sit down, and they get to learn and listen and heal and get stronger so they can be a minister for the rest of their life. Anyway, this is a biblical principle that we see in business. Businesses fall. They, get, they go bankrupt because there's some kind of division. The finances, all kinds of stuff. Next thing you know, they're out of business. Businesses, churches, households will not, div, will not stand if they're divided. Simple concept, but that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of light, and the kingdom of darkness. It's a good principle for all those other lessons, but he's talking about spiritual things here. So, verse 14, and as he was casting out a demon, and it was mute, so it was when the demon had gone out that the mute spoke and the multitudes marveled. Why? Because nobody's been able to cast out a deaf, dumb, mute spirit in anybody up until this moment. That's why they marveled. Wow! You might as well put there. Verse 15. And some said, he cast out demons by Beelzebub, the ruler of demons. He's already cleansed lepers. Nobody's ever cleansed a leper before Jesus. And it was written in the Mishnaic law by the Pharisees, the Messiah will be able to cleanse lepers. All of a sudden, he does it. And they're like, well, I guess he did it by the power of Beelzebub. He's not the Messiah. So 
In scripture, you'll see Moses' sister Miriam had leprosy for seven days, but Moses and his brother Aaron didn't cleanse her. God just gave her leprosy for seven days and took it away seven days. You see, um, in a centurion with leprosy, go to Elijah. He wasn't a Jew. He was a, non, he was a, he was a Gentile. And even Elijah didn't heal him. He sent out a servant, told him to go jump in the river seven times, and he did it. But the servant didn't heal him, Elijah didn't heal him, and he wasn't a Jew. But nowhere in Scripture as a Jew had leprosy ever been cleansed before, but Jesus did it. There's a lot of things Jesus did up in his first two years that only Jesus could do because he's the Son of God. So he cast out demons by the ruler of Beelzebub. So now this is 6, verse 6, chapter, sorry, 16, I believe. I left out that little one. Others, testing him, sought from him a sign from heaven, but he, knowing their thoughts, said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. A house divided against a house falls. Verse 18, if Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? Because you say, I cast out demons by Beelzebub. Here it is. If, and if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. So at the end of this lesson, you'll see Revelation chapter 20, where they were, where John saw people committed on thrones judging the nations. I'll show you that at the end. So just keep make, mark your little Bible there, verse 19. He says, therefore, they will be your judges. So he's going to talk about that later. Verse 20, but if I cast out demons with the finger of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man fully armed guards his own palace, his goods are in peace. But when a, stronger, when a stronger than he comes upon him and overcomes him, he takes from him all his armor in which he's trusted and divides the spoils. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. So Jesus is the strong man here. You're not. You're not stronger than Satan. You're not stronger than any demon. You're an individual. He is the finger of God. Remember when Moses went up to the mountain for 40 days, God with his finger wrote the Ten Commandments. Remember back in John chapter 2 when they were going to, or John chapter 8, when they brought the uh, adulterous woman to him, and he said, the law says those found caught in adultery should be stoned to death. What do you say? And Jesus stood down and wrote on the ground with his finger. We don't know what he says, but some will say he was writing the Ten Commandments. He might have wrote the names of those who were in the midst that were committing adultery. It takes two to commit adultery. They only brought the woman because they were testing him. But the finger of God who wrote the Ten Commandments, who Jesus is the word that became flesh that dwelt among us. He is more than just a finger. He's the Messiah. So it was him that cast him out. And he's given us as an example, Mormon teaching. We have a temple being built up here. Mormon teaches that Satan and Jesus are brothers. It's not what he says. He's the stronger. He can, he can bind Satan. And he can do what he wants. He can cast him out. He's over the kingdom of darkness. So Jesus himself is. A lot of people want the ability to, to bind Satan. We're going to see it in the text. That's not the case. So we'll keep going. Verse 24. This is where he talks about it. When an unclean spirit, that's a demon, goes out of a man, he goes through dry places, seeking rest, finding none. He says, I will return to my house from which I came. And he comes and he finds it swept and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. Why not just tie up the demon and once he cast him out? No, he's free to roam. And he came back with seven more who were free to roam because nobody can tie him up and put him in a quarter and put him in time out. They are free to roam. We have authority to cast him out. We can say, be gone. We can do all that, but we can't tie him up. They're just not. They're free agents. So in this case, they come, he goes and he comes back to the place, finding none. He sees I will return to my house, which in which I came. And when he comes, he finds it swept and put in order. Some versions say empty. And that's how I believe. If you're filled with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is light. Demons cannot enter a body that's filled with the Holy Spirit. They can't coexist together. So an unbeliever, 
who does not, has not received the Holy Spirit, has not asked God or Jesus Christ to come into his life and come into his heart. Revelation 3.20, Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If you open up your heart, I'll come in and dine with you. So until you ask Jesus, who's knocking at the door of your heart, until you ask him to come in, he's not on the inside. It's just you, yourself, me, myself, and I on the inside until I ask Jesus in. That's a distinguishing factor. Christ in you, the hope of glory. All through the New Testament, you see either you're in Christ or you're not in Christ. Either you received, John chapter 1, verse 12, he says, to those who received him, he gave them the right to become children of God. Until you receive him, you're not a child of God. You're a creation of God. Born to be a child of God, but it's on a, you got to receive him. you gotta, you got to have him in your life. Most people are running away from God. I saw a bumper sticker that once says, if you feel far away from God, guess who moved? You. And that's what repentance means. We're making a U-turn, turning back to God, change of heart, change of mind, change of direction towards God. We're going to see that in the scriptures. So he gives us this example in 24 to 26. I've seen people who have relapsed on all kinds of things, and the end of that person was worse than the beginning. Some will say, here's another quick overview. 1 John chapter 5, verses 4, it says, Whoever is born of God overcomes. This is the victory that we have over the world is our faith. Verse 5, who's an overcomer? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Later on in verse 13, he's saying, I write these things to you who believe in the Son of God, that you may continue to believe in him, and that you may know that you have eternal life. Not hope, not maybe. If you believe in the Son of God, continue to believe in Jesus, the Son of God, and you'll know you have eternal life. And then verse 18 says, whoever keeps himself, the wicked one can't touch him. So what does that mean, to keep yourself in obedience? 22 and a half years ago, I quit smoking crack, drinking alcohol, smoking cigarettes. Doesn't mean I haven't fallen into sin in any way, shape, or form, anger, whatever, blah, blah, blah. But when I'm outside of the will of God and I'm walking in disobedience, the enemy can wreak havoc on my life. I'm outside of the protective hand of God, outside of grace. I mean, it's just hard to just give stare, uh, rules, but I've known a lot of hardcore Christians who believe, who walk in the blatant sin, and the world just crashes on them. It happens. But verse 18, 1 John 5, 18 says, whoever keeps himself, the wicked one cannot touch him. Verse 19, the whole world is under the sway of the wicked one. That's a who's who. Either you're in Christ, walking in obedience, and you can sing this MC Hammer song, I do it all the time, can't touch this. Can't touch this. That's if you're in the will of God. You have some authority, you have some protection, and you're in the will of God. Unless you're so good, like Job was, where God says to Satan, hey, have you considered my servant Job? You know how awesome he is? Oh, yeah, that's because you blessed his socks off. Let me take away everything he has, and he'll curse you to his face. Okay, go for it. So he does. Wipes out his family and his business all in one day, and um, nothing. He's still faithful. Second chapter, he says, hey, if you consider my servant Job, he still loves me. He's like, yeah, you know what? It's because he's healthy. Take away his health, he'll curse you to his face. Next thing you know, Job has boils from head to toe, bottoms of his feet. His wife's like, just curse God and die. And what does Job say? The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He was faithful. And at the end of the book of Job, after all his friends was figuring out why this happened to him, because you must be in sin, this is why it's happening to you, they were stupid. All right? Sometimes you just need to sit with somebody who's going through some stuff and just, just ride the wave with them. You don't have to say a word. Just love them. They're, we're all going through stuff. Just, just be a friend. Be side by side. But at the end of the book of Job, God restored him double. So there are times when God will allow his servants to be tested beyond anything you and I would ever want. So it's hard to have these hard, fast rules because we see examples all through Scripture. And all we know is God is sovereign. And whatever comes into my life, it's through his filter. He's either allowing it or it's permissible will, free choice, volition. It's not God's perfect will that we commit adultery, but I had the volition to commit adultery or rob a bank or lie, even though I know those commandments are wrong. It's my job to keep the commandments. John 15, Jesus said, "Those, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And keeping the commandments are not burdensome. 
what's burdensome is when you're breaking commandments left and right, and you got all the frustrations and all the repercussions and consequences from breaking commandments, lying, stealing, cheating, all that. It's tax season. Be honest with your taxes. Pay what you owe. I owe about $4,000 in taxes, and I'm happy for it because I made a lot of money. There's not a lot of money, but I made about $30,000 as an independent contractor, 1099. I didn't want them taking money out of my taxes, out of my check. At the end of the year, I have some deductions for all my mileage. My wife has a W-2. She's got some money taken out, so I did hers first, and based on what she had on her W-2, she's got a refund. So I marked that on the side. I'm paying you that. Now let me add my 1099 and all my mileage, and now I owe about three grand. I'll give them 300 a month, and I'm paying my taxes. And I feel really good about that. This country does a lot with what it doesn't have. <laughs> including helping other countries, sending hundreds of millions to other countries because they need it. And here we are with trillions in deficit, but that's not my job. All I know is I can't expect the government to pay for anything if I'm not putting into the government purse. And I would say the same thing with this church. This church can't do anything if we don't give into this church. And God doesn't need our money, but the more we put into our local church, the more good our local church can do. When someone shows up who's bankrupt and just needing food, there's a benevolence department, there's, there's ways that we can help be in the hands and feet, but it takes money to do anything. And I don't want to turn this into a money thing, but <laughs> it's what's on my heart because there's a lot of people not going to church, watching online, and they're getting out of giving when God loves a cheerful giver. And this is his bride, this is his church, and this is his purse. Just like the government has a purse, and they overspend. They're spending more than they're taking in for taxes. It's tax season, so I'm encouraging you to give them a little extra. Don't lie and cheat on your taxes because you think it's a corrupt government and you don't deserve my money. You live in an awesome country who does a lot of good things. Just our military and our fighter jets, watch Top Gun or Maverick, and you can see the kind of money we have on the technology to make sure that nobody comes and invades this country like China, who we owe all the money to. So just our defense system alone is, is worthy. <laughs> the street lights for our city taxes, the schools, we have teachers that don't get paid a lot of money to teach our bratty kids. They're underpaid and overworked, and that comes from our taxes. All right, Scott? <laughs> anyway, any school teachers in the house, right? That comes from taxes. All right. So anyway, here's an unclean spirit who leaves, comes back, brings seven worse with him, but if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you don't have to worry about seven spirits coming. This is what the Bible tells you about you dealing with Satan and his buddies. James chapter 7, therefore submit to God, that's keeping his commandments, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. He didn't say tie him up, put him in handcuffs, put him in time, you know, bind him. No, he's saying resist him, he'll flee. Just keep doing what God's telling you to do. He's a little fly on the wall. Anybody have a little gnat kind of flying and you're like, just keep. He's a fly. He's a gnat. That's all he is. He has no authority over you. You are sealed with the Holy Spirit for the day of redemption. You are a child of God. When you know that and you walk in that, he can't touch you. So stop trying to figure out what he's doing, what he's not doing. You stay in your lane and you do what God's calling you to do. Because I know the enemy's trying to talk you into doing another good thing to keep you off the God thing you're supposed to be doing. Being a good dad, being a good worker at job, whatever he's having you do, wherever you work, you salt your light, you're an ambassador for Christ, you're bearing witness, you're telling your story, you're telling your testimony, and he's trying to get you off course. He says, resist the devil, he'll flee from you. Draw near to God, and he'll draw near to you. A lot of us go to Celebrate Recovery. There's 12 steps. They're great principles. But I once heard a guy say, I got a one-step program, one step closer to God. And if you, do, you, know, you just focus on that, you know, all the other principles will work themselves out too. And that's it. Either we're drawn close to God. That's repentance. Change your heart, change your mind, change your direction. I'm going closer to God. He's getting closer to me. When I go to work, I'm getting away from my wife. She's at home, and i got to go to work. And then I'm coming back home. i got my ETA. I tell her, I'll be there in 25 minutes. I can't wait to kiss you. And I'm drawing closer to my wife. I walk in the door. I give her a big kiss. There was some distance between us because we had to split up, and I come back together every single night. And the enemy's trying to do the same thing in your relationships and your marriages. He's trying to get you to a house divided will not stand. He's been going after the family, after the husband, the wife, the kids. He's out to destroy. And this is our answer. We resist him. And he'll flee from us. We draw closer to God. He'll draw closer to us. Here's our part. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, you people who miss the mark all the time, who don't hit a bullseye with everything you say you do. That's what sin means. We miss the mark. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. 
Purify your hearts. That's a word for somebody who's clicking on pornography today. Cricket, cricket, cricket. Elephant in the room. Over 50% of pastors in anonymous, anonymous surveys admit that they struggle with pornography. 38% of women, 80% of men. It's a click away, one click away from stupid. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. And this is Ephesians 6. Nowhere in here does Paul, who teaches on spiritual armor, tell you to tie them up, bond them up, round them up. Verse 10, you, we read this a lot. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. This is Ephesians 6, starting in verse 10. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Not tie them up, bound them up, throw them up, you know, whatever. We're standing against the wiles of the devil. Verse 12, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness. There's your demons. In the heavenly places. Verse 13, therefore, based on what I just told you, therefore, because what I just wrote, therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Verse 14 starts with the same word, stand. You get the point? Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, top of the list, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you'll be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Well, why not just tie them up and then you won't be able to shoot darts at me anymore? Because you can't. You'll always be having darts shot at you. But what does God tell you to do? Take your shield of faith to quench them. You're going to get shot at. Count on it, especially when you start becoming intentional about sharing the gospel, making disciples, or in this case, Jesus, coming to die on a cross to redeem the world. You're going to get some shots at you. And if you're not getting any shots at you, you're probably no threat to the evil one. You're not even on his radar. He's not even messing with you because you're not even worthy of his time. You're sitting on the couch eating bonbons, doing nothing with your testimony, nothing with the word of God. You're not even advancing the kingdom. It was taught to me this last week. It just dawned on me. He says, when he told Peter, he says, death and Hades will not prevail. The gates of death and Hades will not prevail against my kingdom. And the guy said, gates are stationary. They're meant to keep people in and meant to keep people out. The gates are not moving forward. We are moving forward. We are advancing the kingdom of God. We are taking it by force. We are going through the gates of hell to redeem and bring somebody who's been taken hostage out of his camp and back into the kingdom of God. They've been taken hostage by Satan to do his will. That's exactly what 1 John 5, 19 says. The whole world is under the sway of the wicked one. If this was a chess game, he's got some pawns, he's got some bishops, queens, knights, and a king. He's the king. Right? We all know chess. There's 8 billion pl players on the planet right now. Some of them are kingdom of darkness, and some of them are kingdom of light. The whole world is under the sway of wickedness. It's our job to seek and save that which is lost. The gates of hell will not prevail because we're going to bust through them. We have the authority that the whole armor of God is to advance the kingdom. We're not just sitting in a corner playing defense and, he's beating me up. He's beating me up. No, we have authority to move forward and take back what he has stolen. So the shield of faith, which is able to quench all the fiery darts from the wicked one. Verse 17, take the helmet of salvation. This is your thinking cap. What you think, stinking thinking. Helmet of salvation. Remember who you are. We just sang that song, I'm a child of God. I've been set free. That's who I am. This is where the enemy attacks. He gets you to doubt what you, who you are, your identity in Christ. Same CR Celebrate Recovery Group. We don't identify ourselves as an, hi, I'm Chuck, I'm an alcoholic. I can't say, hi, I'm Chuck, I'm a crack addict. That was 22 and a half years ago. I haven't smoked crack. I haven't smoked cigarette. I don't drink a beer. I'm not an alcoholic. I struggle with lust. I struggle with anger. I'm one, still one decision away from stupid, but I keep my heart pure, my hands clean. But if I let my flesh do what it wanted to do, it would run back in the mud. But because God has saved me from that, I'm not going back to it. It's a choice. I'm going to walk in obedience to God. 
Verse 17, taking the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Side note here, this is the only offensive piece of, everything here is defensive. The shield of faith, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth. My little feet are covered with the gospel of, uh, God, you know, the gospel of peace. I had a fireman once bringing all his gear up on stage and go through this. And every piece of the fireman's gear, their helmet, the boots that they wear to walk through fire and kick down doors, and those jackets, it's like 50 pounds of gear to protect themselves to go into a burning building and take out, put out a fire. But here, the, the sword is the only thing that's offensive. And what is it? It's the Word of God. That's your Bible. That's what cuts through all the minutia that the world is throwing at you. How do you know what's true is what, what's not true? The Bible has an opinion on everything. And guess who wrote it? God has an opinion on everything. When somebody says, hey, man, don't judge me, I said, I'm not. He did. I'm just telling you what the judge already said about this. I'm just the clerk bailiff, the clerk and the bailiff handed me from the jury. He's the judge, jury, and executioner. And the jury's in. And it was given to the clerk to read the verdict. Guilty. You're guilty. And you need to cry for mercy from God. We're all guilty. We're all in trouble. Apart from God's mercy and grace, we are lost and deserve. But what does Romans say? Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. That's what my wages deserve. I deserve a death. I deserve a beating. But the gift of God is eternal life. That's a gift. And either you're going to receive it or you're going to reject it. And if you do, you're on your own. And I don't want to, I feel sorry for you. I don't want to be you on judgment day. Verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. That's not in tongues. Capital S is Holy Spirit. It has nothing to do with praying in tongues. I hate that teaching. When God wants to talk to you, it's going to be words you understand and words he understands. Praying in the spirit is like praying in the will of God. It's praying according to his will, praying his word back to him, coming into agreement with what he's already said. Praying in the spirit, be watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplications for the saints. And I might add, he goes on to say, and pray for me that utterance might be given to me, that I might make known this mystery of the gospel, which I'm in chains for, I'm in jail for that I might open my mouth and speak boldly as I ought to speak. That's what he was asking for prayer for, that we might have utterance, that we can speak boldly as we ought to speak, not coward back and say, I'm not going to talk about politics and religion. I might offend somebody. If I offend somebody, that's the one I want to spend the rest of my time talking to. If somebody's little feathers get ruffled over some truth, I'm going to spend the rest of my time talking to him, not the rest of you guys who are already on the same page. Verse 27. And it happened as he spoke these things that a certain woman from the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast that nursed you. Who's he talking about? Mary. I was raised Catholic. Man, they give her a lot of credit. Love Mary. Played a very important part. She was a virgin. Gave birth to the Messiah. Didn't see an abortion doctor. <laughs> she gave birth to the Messiah. At 14, 15, or 16 years old when the whole world thought she was cheating on Joseph. Talk about gossip very important role. But what does Jesus say? Yeah, Mary, that's my mom. Make sure you pray to her. Get the rosary. Do that. You know, <laughs> no. He's like, more than that? More than my mom? Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. You're more blessed than Mary when you're in obedience. Is that possible? Not according to the Catholics. I'm sorry, I beat up a few different denominations up here, but it's my job because I heard a lot of crap along the years, religion stuff. And when I read the Bible, I tend to say, hey, mm, that really doesn't line up with some of their traditions or some of the things I heard, but I'm going to preach this. If you have a problem with me, see me after church. But he said, more than that, blessed are those who keep the, word, keep the word of God. And then I had to throw in James. Here's James again, the same one who told you to resist the devil, he'll flee from you. Well, in James chapter 1, he says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Does anybody ever wake up today and say, I'm going to work and I'm deceived? about a couple things. The person who's deceived doesn't know he's deceived. He thinks one plus, three, one, plus one is three. Until you show him, no, dude, one, two. One, two, two. Man, I thought it was three this whole time. If I went to church and heard the same lie every week or every day, I'd believe it. I know a guy who went to Mass 40 years every day, 
and heard that Mary was like a co-redeemer and pray to Mary and all that kind of stuff. He didn't mess with his salvation. He understood Jesus died for our sins. You know he rose again. He's judging the living and the dead. He understood the Trinity really well, but for every day for 40 years, he heard him add a little extra stuff about Mary, and that's just what he believed. He was, I don't think it affected his salvation. I think he knew exactly who God the Father was, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So I don't like when people give too much of a hard time for any denomination. It's easy to do. And God knows who are his. God knows who has a saving knowledge of Jesus. And we're all subject to the teachers we're subject to. And he said there'll be some false prophets, false teachers. You know, nobody's got 100%. But I know this book is 100%. So I try to stick with the book. Anytime I elaborate over here, I run the risk of over-explaining it or under-explaining it. So I like that's why I always throw a lot of verses up here. Be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Verse 23, if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face in the mirror, for he observes himself and goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. The Bible is a mirror. When you look into the mirror, it's an equal opportunity offender. I've had so many people tell me, oh, man wrote the Bible. Really? If he did, why is it so convicting to everybody? Why is it not just a bunch of lists of everything I like to do? <laughs> and affirming everything I think is right. So it's an equal opportunity offender. When I woke up this morning, I put up to my sermon, and I jump in the shower before I come here, and if I, I didn't shave, I didn't put my eye drops in, I didn't do, I'm starting to do a little dew at the top with some gel, because you know Becca's been doing my hair, the one fade, and I got a little bit, maybe a year or two or three left before I can do anything with this up top. So I'm, you know, I'm doing the updo with the gel, but if I just looked at it and say, no, I'm good, I'm gonna go to church, you know, and here I am in my pajamas, my you know, bedhead, no, man, we get up for the day. We look in the mirror, and we know what we got to do. Brush your teeth, whatever, right? Take care of that thing. So anyway, <laughs> this is that's a good example. I'm looking at who I am, and I'm not going to do anything about it. So he says, verse 25, but he who looks into the perfect law of liberty, not religion, again, religion strangles, liberty is freedom, looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work starts with doer of the word, turns into doer of the work. What does Peter? Uh, what does First Timothy say? You know, pure and undefiled religion. Sorry, I think it's it's in this verse, uh, James, a little bit later. Pure and undefiled religion is to visit widows in time of need and orphans, and to keep yourself unspotted from the world. Muy importante. <laughs> that second half. Yeah, I can love and help widows, and I can take care of orphans, but I'm pouring out. Or pick another sin, picking on porn because everybody's, not everybody, but there's a lot of people, especially those who are watching church online, <laughs> whatever. I'm just saying it's an issue. Clean it up. Get pure. Get right. Be a doer of the work. What does God have for you to do? Ephesians 2.10, and that's what these guys that I was with this weekend it was on the Ephesians 2.10 project. Don wrote this book 10 years ago to help you find out what your spiritual gifts are. Everybody knows about personality tests and profile testing. You know, either you're a driver controller or you're analytical. You might be an amiable person or you might be expressive and you kind of fall in one of those camps or whatever. But this is a spiritual aptitude test to figure out what you're passionate about, what you're good at, and what the need is. If I'm passionate about something and I'm really good at something by nature and then there's a need in the world where all three of those circles meet, it makes an ichthys in the middle. A little fish. If you overlap three circles, you'll have an ichthys in the middle. You know, a ministry that, that was their theme verse, Romans 8, 8, 28. All things work together for good for those who love God, those who are called according to his purposes. So all this stuff gives you something to do. We're not saved by our good works, and most of the world's religion thinks, I hope my good outweighs my bad. That's not the gospel. You've got bad, and you're in trouble. If I murdered your mom... I spent the rest of my life giving the United Way, United Way and the Boys and Girls Ranch, and I've done, you know, just all these good things. And on Judgment Day, I'm like, I did a lot of good. I gave you 10%, but you murdered his mom. That's not going to take care of that, or any sin for that matter. That's what Jesus died on the cross for, it was that, all that. And so Ephesians 2.8 says, we've been saved by grace through faith, it's not of works, lest anybody should boast or brag, but you are God's workmanship, created in Christ, there's that in Christ again, for good works, 
that God prepared beforehand that you should walk in them. Ephesians 2.10. So it's your job to figure out now that you've been saved, not by your good works, but for good works, that you should walk in them. So that's what he's talking about here. Be a doer of the work. The one, this one, will be blessed in what he does. Who wants to be blessed in everything you do? Be a doer of the word. That's what Jesus said. More than my mom, blessed is he who keeps, you know, has the word of God and does it and keeps it. So now they want a sign. They just, he just got them delivering a deaf, dumb, mute, demon-possessed mute. Now they want a sign from heaven. And while the crowds were thickly gathered together, he began to say, this is an evil generation. Can we say that about this generation? Uh-huh. It seeks a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah the prophet. For as Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, so also the Son of Man will be to this generation. It's a sign of resurrection. Jonah was dead in the belly of the fish for three days. That's why he associates with Jesus. Just like Jonah was in for three days, I'm going to be in the belly of the earth for three days and come back to life. Jonah was a resurrected. When he was crying out and from Sheol, that word in Sheol where Jonah was crying out in the belly of the fish is another word for the abyss, which is the other word for the other side. So nobody can live in the belly of the fish for three days, and that's why most people struggle with it. But even one worse than that, he was dead. And God brought him back together, back to life. He can do that. He resurrected Jonah. He's resurrecting Jesus. The two guys in the book of Revelation, when they're prophesying for 1,260 days, and then they're finally killed, and they're sitting in the streets of Jerusalem for three days. Everybody on the earth is giving presents to one another, and all of a sudden, boom, God resurrects them, and they ascend to heaven. And the whole world sees it. We have CNN, Fox News, MSNBC, Internet cams. When these, three pro these two prophets are dead in the city of Jerusalem, and all the wicked people are sending gifts because they were prophesying against them, and all of a sudden, the whole world sees these two guys resurrected and ascend to heaven, and the whole world can see it. That's going to be the aha moment, Romans eleven twenty six, when all Israel will be saved. That's the final sign, some will say. However, back to Jonah. Jonah was a sign. Dead man spit back on the ground, chapter, verse, chapter 3, verse 1. And the word came to Jonah again, saying, go to Nineveh and tell them to knock it off. That was like going into ISIS's camp. Nineveh was beheading people. They were wicked. This is not like, hey, go teach Sunday school. No, I'm going the other way. This is like, go preach to ISIS before I destroy them. And like, oh, you'd be better off just taking ISIS out. That's what Jonah was saying. Uh, you're better off destroying them. I'm going the other way. And when God calls you to do something, no matter what it is, do it. <laughs> we don't want you to end up in the belly of a fish and then spit out on dry gland. But he says, for Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, so also the Son of Man will be to this generation. The queen of the south will rise up in judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. Because there's men in this generation who do believe that Jesus is the Son of God. right? For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And indeed, a greater than Solomon is here. Up until this point, the scriptures said that Solomon was the wisest man who ever lived. And it's true because it was Bible. Now he's saying there's one, wiser, one greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh will rise up in judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, not his good works, not, oh, I'll just do good until they ask me what's different about me and my life. And, wow, you're a really different person. Tell me about your God. I want what you have. Has anybody ever said that to you? Some people, that's their witnessing approach. I'll wait till they bring it up, then I'll tell them about Jesus. No, <laughs> Jonah went and preached to him. Preaching means proclaiming, telling the truth, truth and love. There's, a, there's some idiot preachers out there. I don't want to be one of them. I tend to go a little bit overboard here. I've got about 5,000 Facebook friends who think it's crazy that I'm a preacher 35 years later after being a player in high school and all that. So I just never know who's going to hear what. But So they, they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and indeed, a greater than Jonah is here. Side note, too, the Pharisees didn't count Jonah as a prophet because he was disobedient in chapter 1. He went the other way. So they don't count him as a prophet. So even when Pharisees, when they asked, do you ever know any prophet that came from, from Galilee? Uh, yeah, Jonah. He was from Galilee. Verse 20. So I wanted to bring this up. This is where and only where you'll see Satan bound. Revelation chapter 20. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. 
he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should not, so he should deceive the nations no more until the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. In verse 4, this is the people in the judgment. This is why I brought this up and I didn't even realize it's after. Verse 4, and I saw thrones and they sat on them. Who's the they? So Jesus was just telling you, the people from Nineveh, there's going to be a great white judgment throne. He goes on. If you read later on in this chapter, I didn't put it all in here. But anyway, I saw the, and judgment was committed to them. So God, when we get on the other side, we're going to be judges in, in the kingdom of heaven for a thousand years. So I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God. There may come a day where they're going to behead you because you say, I follow Jesus. In some country, that's a reality. Iran, Iraq, uh, all the whole Middle East, it's like serious persecution if you decide to follow Jesus. It's called the voice of the martyrs. You go back to Revelation 6, verses 9 through 11. You see the souls who are, who are killed for the word of God crying out, How long, O Lord, until you avenge our blood on those on the earth? And the Lord said to them, Here's a white robe. Rest a little while longer. That's where we get rest in peace until the number of saints that will die is completed. God knows there's an X amount of people that are killed because of their faith in him. Not the ones who run into the room and blow themselves up with a bunch of other people who want to be a martyr. No, you're a murderer. You murdered yourself and everybody else in the room. That's innocent blood. They didn't do anything deserving of death, and you blew yourself up wanting to be a martyr because Islam promises guaranteed eternal life to you and your family members if you die for the cause. That's why they sign up and do that. That's not our gospel. 1 John 5.13 says, if you believe in the Son of God, you may know that you have eternal life. 1.5 billion Muslim slash Islamics think that they still don't even know what Allah is going to do when and if they die, if they're good enough. But if you martyr yourself, it's guaranteed. You and your family, plus you get 70 virgins. A little bonus, bonus point. Back to the purity message. <laughs> So you see how that's attractive. You can see why somebody might kill themselves because they're trying to earn eternal life for them and their family because that religion doesn't have a promise to it. That's why I proclaim the word of God. So you know that by trusting in Jesus, you're in. That's it. Your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. We'll keep reading here and finish up. So he says, And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the witness to Jesus and the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and has not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Three times, he says, a thousand years. If that's what it says, that's what I believe. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who's part of the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. There's four times. So a thousand years is a thousand years. That's what it means. And they can live a thousand years because they just got a resurrected body that lives forever. A thousand years is no big deal for God. It's not a hat, hat trick. It's a resurrection, brand new spiritual body that lives for a thousand years. We rule and reign with him as priests. And then after that, Satan's released again, and there's some more. That's, that's like a thousand years. Even if from today, that'd be a thousand years from now. You don't even need to know anything more about what happens after a thousand years. You have more than enough information to know that you need to know right here. And then he ends with this in verse 33. No one, when he has, a, has lit a lamp, puts it in a secret place under a basket, but on a lampstand that those who come in may see the light. The lamp of the body is the eye. Therefore, when your eye is good, your whole body also is full of light. But when your eye is bad, your body also is full of darkness. Therefore, take heed that your light, which is in you, is not darkness. If then your whole body is full of light, having no part dark, the whole body will be full of light, as when the bright shining of a lamp gives you light. Do I need to bring up pornography again? What we look at, what we listen to, the pride of life, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes. The lust of the eyes, the pride of life, 
Those three is the root of all sin. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Every sin on the planet, is that's the root issue. If you don't get rid of the root issue, just like when we, I had Donald come to our house, and we had just a bunch of roots, uh, weeds that grew up through the rocks, and if you don't get out the root, they're coming back. And I, for, Donald just took out all the rocks, started digging out the roots, and it's been a year later, and I'll have one, one weed in my yard still, because Donald did it right. Thank you, by the way. I was just noticing yesterday, man, it's been almost a year, and I haven't seen it, because you did it right. You got the root. Anybody who's done gardening, you know you got to get the root for the weeds, right? right. Or weed kill. That's, you spray it, and that's even the easy way. You don't mess with your manicure. You spray it, and it kills the root, and it doesn't grow back. Anyway, but he talks about what we're looking at. We're looking unto Jesus. Revela uh, I'll end with this. Hebrews, 20, Hebrews 12. Looking unto Jesus, the author, beginner, or finisher slash perfecter. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith who for the joy that was set before him, you're his joy, the kingdom of heaven was the joy set before him. He endured the cross, despising its shame. That's how he got through the cross. He was thinking of you and all of us being in heaven forever. I'm going to pay this bill once and for all. Done. Because the joy that was set before him, us with him forever, that was a joy that God had, that his creation will be with him forever. But you have free will. Either you're going to receive him or you're going to reject him. And everything I read, it does not end well for the person who rejects God, his son, Jesus Christ, and the gift of the Holy Spirit. It just doesn't. Are we perfect? No. But we are getting better. Amen? Amen. All right. So anybody who wants to catch some previous teachings, Fruitland Christian Fellowship, we're on Overcomers TV, Roku, Apple TV, Amazon Fire TV. Go to your app store, Google Play, iOS. Download overcomers.tv. It's a it's a TV channel, just like any others, with shows starting every half hour. But our show starts every night around 9 o'clock to 11. 9 o'clock to 10 here, 11 to midnight on the East Coast. The last seven Sundays, we rebroadcast. And boy, you just go straight to our YouTube channel. We've got about 100 of the last two years recorded. Pastor Jared, even Chris, and some of the other guys, Scott, his testimony. We're, we're going to be recording some more testimonies for the channel as well. We also take our audio. It's available on all the podcast platforms. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeart, Google are the most popular. Type in Chris, Christian Fruitland Christian Fellowship. Fruitland Christian Fellowship. Follow the show right when we're done. They upload it there, and you can listen to it when you're driving around. Hey, Wednesday night, we're starting... Financial Peace University for the second time. Before we do that, around 7.15, from around 5.45, 6 o'clock, we gather for food and fellowship. And Jared usually does a teaching on a book um, and just learning how to live biblically. So um, the Financial Peace University is like a second class, if you will, um, to uh, keep our mind on good stewardship issues. And if you're ever in the area, please come join us. Uh, Fruitland Christian Fellowship at Gmail if you want to shoot us an email. 505-374-8900 if you want to give us a call or text that number. Um, Hani takes care of that line. And uh, we're in Fruitland, New Mexico, right next to Kirtland. And Farmington is like three little cities that are kind of cousins. 701 County Road 6100, Fruitland, New Mexico. And uh, I want to pray for our viewers and anybody else in our house. Father, we thank you for this time to huddle up and listen to your word. And we do want to be doers of your word, not just hearers only. You know where we're at, what we've done, what we, we, we need to quit. And, we, and to live righteously, to do the right thing, and to live in obedience to you, Father God. We thank you for your amazing grace and your mercy, willing to forgive us. That if we confess our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive us our sins and wash us clean of all righteousness, as 1 John 1, 9 says. And also James tells us that if we confess our sins and trust our trespasses one to another and we pray for one another, that we'll be healed. And God, I know there's many people, our friends, our family, and people in our church that need healing. So as we pray for one another, we believe you are the healer and you're going to do that work, whether it's on this side of heaven or that side. We'll get our healing when we get there in a new spiritual body. Whatever you will, your will be done. Uh, no, we want the best, but God, you, you know best. So we just trust you, Lord, with all of our heart. Pray you bless our family, our friends, our time together as we move into fellowship and food. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I'll uh, end with a song. Good way to, Amazing Grace is probably that good song to start.